I know, I'm as shocked as you are. Going into How I Met Your Father, I wasn't expecting to like it at all, really. The trailer was incredibly unfunny. We're the bravest people in this city! <clears throat> the idea of making a spin-off of How I Met Your Mother with none of the main cast returning felt kind of pointless. And even though I like How I Met Your Mother, that show has some serious issues that I do hope to elaborate on in a future video in more detail. So to say I was skeptical is an understatement. Then, I watched episode 1 and it was... fine? It wasn't fantastic, but it had some pretty neat character stuff, though the comedy fell flat for me for the most part. Still, I was willing to give this show a chance. I was going to watch all of it anyway out of simply morbid curiosity. So I was interested in seeing how episode 2 would fare. And... that was the episode that won me over. It didn't reinvent the wheel, it didn't have the best comedy, and it wasn't even better than episode 1 really. The reason I liked it so much is because that was the episode where I realized the writers knew exactly how to write their characters and the situations they're in to fit their development. And with that, the show has just been improving massively after every episode, to a point where this is better than season 1 of How Metro Mother was, I'd say. So with that, I'd like to give you all a little insight as to why I think How Metro Father is unexpectedly a pretty good show. So let us begin. The show, like How My Your Mother, is narrated by an older version of the main character who's 28 years into the future. And apparently people really don't like her when she shows up from what I've read online. I, however, feel like she's a much better alternative than what they did in How I Met Your Mother. In the original show, Future Ted was talking to his kids and all we had was reaction shots of the kids. Whereas this show has old Sophie talking to her son on the phone, and her son never appears, so all we hear is his voice. The reason why I really like this idea is because of how Metro Mother's most hated episode, the finale, exists because of the way they shot the show. Because Ted's children would get older as each season went on, and the story is supposed to be that Ted is talking to his children over one sitting about how he met their mother. They had to shoot all the children scenes, including the ones that appeared in the finale, during season 2. That meant that the ending for the show was written during season 2, and it only occurred in season 9, which meant we had 7 seasons that should have led to that finale, but that actually actively showed that the finale was not built up at all, especially with Ted getting together with Robin by the end. By how much your father not having the shots with the children, the show can afford to evolve as it pleases, and not be tied into what story they think they want so close to the beginning of the show. So that's something I already appreciate about How I Met Your Father, but I also quite like the way Sophie is just casually chatting about her life, as if she's just speaking of fond memories, and not how it felt like Ted had a whole script during his narration, especially when sometimes Ted would be interrupted by characters in his stories or things of that nature. So just with this stuff, I'm already quite happy. Because I went into the show thinking, I imagine I'll have to enjoy this show like I do How I Met Your Mother, which is in spite of certain quirks and epics that I have about a few aspects of the show, such as how the narrator worked in the original show. But How I Met Your Father actually does a really good job at avoiding these pitfalls from the original show, especially one related to comedy that I'll talk about later in the video. The only thing that annoys me, that seems to have been done simply because it's connected to How I Met Your Mother, is having the laugh track. Michelle Obama. Though, thankfully, it's way more minimal than How I Met Your Mother's, which was already minimal to begin with compared to other sitcoms. Well, the bees escaped their enclosure, but no reason to be concerned. <laughs> Bazinga! <laughs> However, I think it's time we talk about the actual meat of the show, the characters and the comedy. For starters, I'm gonna talk about the least impressive aspect of the two, which is the comedy. This show was interesting because I wouldn't say it's funny, like it's not that the comedy is bad, I'd say mostly holds up, especially since episode 3, but it does feel sometimes in making me laugh. But I'd say the show doesn't focus that much on comedy. However, I don't necessarily find that an issue. What I mean is that, sometimes, sitcoms will have jokes only for the sake of making the audience laugh. You have a character making a punchline that none of the other characters find funny, or that doesn't actually further any character's development. Ted, I'm freaking out, man. It's a new car, so just be careful. I did something stupid. Can we just drive somewhere? I need to get away. Just drive, man. Please just drive. It's just, this is a really good parking spot. Dude! This example actually being a character inconsistency for Ted, but that's not what I'm gonna address here. My point is that the joke here is only there for the audience to laugh. So, if the audience doesn't find it funny, like with what a lot of people say about season 9 of How I Met Your Mother, there's nothing of value to be gained from it. However, if we look at How I Met Your Father... How was your date with Ian? Was he tall? Yes. Were his eyes as kind as his photo? Yes! <laughs> Why aren't you jumping? Because he's moving to Australia. Yeah. So, if I am so sorry. Did you bang one out anyway? We have Sophie actually laughing at what Valentina said. Did you bang one out anyway? <laughs> oh, I 
at least I still have you. And I find that really important as a way to show the characters getting along. Seeing as the show is about a group of friends, and seeing as Valentina and Sophie are best friends, the fact Valentina makes a comment like that would seem very inappropriate, like something Barney would say simply because he's like that. However, here, not only does it seem like they're just friends who were very comfortable with each other, it also shows that Valentina knows how to cheer up her best friend. And the funny thing is that I don't even find that joke funny. But seeing Sophie laugh made me smile because of how I can see these two are good friends, and how Sophie actually liked the joke Valentina made, rather than what you'd see with characters in How I Met Your Mother being uncomfortable with Barney's comments because we know he's 100% serious. I'm going to an amnesia ward with a bunch of photos of my children and a wedding ring. I'm gonna find the hottest patient slash my wife, and we are going Okay, to so that's good enough for tonight. <laughs> I gotta ease back into this. See you tomorrow. <laughs> That's made even worse in shows like The Big Bang Theory or Friends when you're able to put aside the laugh track and you see that the way these jokes are structured make them seem like the situations are very awkward. Something really happened last night. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Ross invited us all to watch. What is the matter with you? But I don't feel like this would be true for How I Met Your Father because the characters seem like they're making jokes for each other and not the audience. I know I've been praising the comedy here, but it's honestly pretty hit or miss, with the best jokes usually being the subtler ones. Sid and Jesse don't wear cufflinks. They're just two regular New York guys. And if you want them to like you, you're just gonna have to be a little more of the people. I swear when I'm allowed to be my normal fancy self, I'm an absolute bloody delight. Those cufflinks are gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> Rather than the big cutaway jokes. Probably just gonna stay in and organize my darkroom closet. Oh, you mean look at pictures of Ian while listening to Drops of Jupiter on loop like you do every time things don't work out with a guy? Tell me, did the wind sweep you off your feet? Especially when, usually, the subtler ones are able to characterize everyone better by feeling more natural with the flow of the show. The thing that I find good is that, thankfully, even when the comedy isn't funny, it helps characterize everyone pretty well, even outside of what I said before about characters seeming to have a good time with each other, which brings me to the part of the show that I like the most, the characters. I won't go fully in depth, so I'll just mention some of the highlights of the character work in the show, so that this doesn't turn into a huge video breaking everything down. I find that the way this show built its characters is very good and not at all how I expected it. You can tell the characters are still following certain archetypes, or somewhat based on the characters from How I Met Your Mother. Sophie is obviously like Ted, being the one telling the story of how she met the father of her children, but going back to the beginning of the story, of the entire journey, of becoming who she needed to be to meet him. Also being a romantic who believes she'll meet the love of her life in a city full of perverts and jackasses. I've lived in New York since college, but I've never walked across the Brooklyn Bridge. And after a while, I waited so long that I decided I would wait and walk it with my soulmate. But I do feel like she's more realistic in that depiction. Ted seemed like he never actually wanted to take it further with any girl other than Robin until he met Tracy. And even with Robin, he knew the relationship wouldn't last. Ted's biggest trait was being a hopeless romantic who couldn't ever make his relationships work. Someone who had to do the most romantic gestures because he doesn't know how to do anything any other way, such as trying to make it rain to stop Robin from going on a camping trip, or having a string quartet at Robin's place to ask her if she wants to go out with him, or saying he's in love with her on their first date. With Sophie, the only romantic gesture from her is wanting to cross a Brooklyn bridge with her soulmate, which, by the end of the episode, she ends up walking the bridge without the love of her life. She ends up being able to appreciate the beauty and magic of New York City without having to share it with her soulmate. She's still a romantic despite her parents never having a good relationship, which is later developed in the episode where we meet her mom. And that episode actually develops on Sophie wanting to find the perfect guy in the middle of a lot of bad ones. By virtue of her mom always dating a bunch of guys she always thought weren't right for her mom. Until she realizes the problem was her mom not being good at relationships with men. Meaning that the episode with her mom basically mirrors her own experience, seeing as Sophie turned 30 recently and has never been in a serious relationship while her mom also hasn't been in a serious relationship, and she just bounces from guy to guy. The difference being that Sophie isn't the reason why her relationships fail, whereas her mom is what dooms her own relationships. Even if that is not entirely absent from Sophie, the idea of forcing herself to pretend to be someone else or change herself so that she can maintain a relationship, seeing as she tried to impress Drew by pretending to be a very uptight and organized woman when in reality she still enjoys being young and being able to party and be reckless and disorganized, not having her life fully together, which I feel Drew is a big part of making her change for the better and realize that she needs to be more honest with herself, which is especially shown in episode 6 when she goes to a venue that Sid and his fiancée are looking for their wedding, 
and she realizes that Drew lied about never being there, and that he's actually been there with his ex. And so she freaks out about it and causes a mess, which later makes her realize, through talking with Sid and then Drew, that she was scared about going into a serious relationship with Drew, because she's never been in a serious relationship ever, and so she was projecting onto Drew her own fears about getting serious with him, and trying to find a reason to be scared that it wouldn't work out. I know it's super scary to go all in on a relationship, and from what I know about your childhood, you probably feel like the rug could be ripped out from under you at any second. Yeah. I do. But, if it's the right person, things can work out. I promise. I don't mean to take anything away from Ted. Obviously, I haven't gone in depth into his character here. But Ted always felt like more an idealized version of a romantic than a realistic one. Whereas I feel like Sophie feels way more like someone you'd know, especially due to her backstory actually impacting her character way more than Ted, considering his parents were still together, to his knowledge, until season 2 of the show. Then we have Sid, who was supposed to be the marshal of the show, getting engaged in episode 1 while having to deal with relationship issues with his fiancée and trying to find his way in life. Now, Marshall obviously had been studying to become a lawyer and he knew he wanted to be an environmental lawyer, the reason for which is somewhat developed as the show goes on, but I feel like Sid has a much more interesting reason to do what he does, especially when it also leads to relationship issues that work way better than between Marshall and Lily, when something similar happens in How I Met Your Mother. In reference to season 6 when Lily gets upset when Marshall starts working on an environmental law firm because I'm not fine that he volunteers our apartment for a giant fundraiser and that he's not thinking about how we're gonna pay any of our bills and that apparently we've given up on trying to have kids. When she explicitly said If you want to quit your job and go work for the NRDC right now, then you need to do that right now. And then once you've cleaned up all the oceans and, and saved the planet, you know, like a year from now, then we'll start a family. Three episodes earlier. I feel like Sid is a lot better because the conflict comes from him up and changing his and Hannah's lives on a whim, without asking her at all. And she's never really talked to him about it. Sid knew Hannah would be okay with it if he asked her, but he never did. And she's upset because she's never consulted on any decisions. And so, even if for Marshall we do get a reason for why he wants to be an environmental lawyer now, for Sid, he's already made the decision that changed their lives. And we're seeing the aftermath. And then we get the reason why he never asked her about buying his bar. Why didn't you ask her? I don't know. I spent the first 20-some years of my life trying to make my parents happy. Then I met Hannah, I wanted to make her happy too. And with the bar, I just finally wanted to do something that would make me happy. And I knew if I didn't just like propel my body to that bank and apply for that loan, I'd end up chickening out. Do you think if you had asked Hannah first that she wouldn't have supported you? No, she would have. Definitely would have. <laughs> Messed up. It's all very natural in how you can tell he was scared about talking to someone important to him about something important to him because of some irrational fear of her not being okay with something he knows she would be. Which I can tell from personal experience is very common to happen with people who deal with anxiety. I also particularly like that Hannah doesn't get that much screen time too because she'd be the Lily mirror in this show and, you know, Lily is awful. But that's something to talk about when I go in depth into the original show. The sales guy was rude to Robin, so I took a pair of khakis. I gave them to you for your birthday. So I've been walking around in stolen khakis. Oh, I prefer to call them justice khakis. That's not justice, it's shoplifting and it's a crime. So is being mean. Then we have Jesse, who'd be the Robin of the show. The character who doesn't believe in love in a sense. The character who's extremely cynical and objective rather than emotional. And Ellen, his sister, who doesn't really have a counterpart in How I Met Your Mother, but I'd say she's very much like Phoebe from Friends. Robin in the original show doesn't really want to get married or have kids, and it's presumably because her parents got divorced as she was growing up, and because of how her father raised her. Which I don't find bad, but I do really like how Jesse's reason was that his girlfriend rejected his proposal. The girl who he thought was the love of his life and supposed to end up with him. Not just that his parents got divorced. And so what sparks him into wanting to get back to dating is Sophie. Despite her parents not having had a magical love story that lasted for the past 30 years, like Jesse thought, with her dad never being in the picture and her mom being a party girl bouncing from guy to guy, Sophie still is a romantic person who believes in love. And that's what allows Jesse to realize that his experience with his ex doesn't define him even if it takes a while for him to take steps towards moving on from it, seeing as it was something very traumatic to him. I also really like how his life growing up is also brought back into his mind due to his sister moving to New York, and him having to deal with the fact he wasn't able to grow up with his little sister to hang out with and look after like he wanted to. 
All this, I think, makes for a really compelling character considering the divorce of his parents clearly left a big impact on him he never was able to deal with, and he tries to just become close to his sister without having to deal with those feelings of abandonment they both felt. You were there when I was little, and then you just disappeared. So I moved here thinking we could reconnect and pick up where we left off, but now I don't know if we can. Which is explored really well with both Jesse and Ellen. You know, I remember the day that mom and dad brought you home from Vietnam. I was three, but I remember because it was like the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me. I was totally obsessed with you. And you couldn't even do anything but poop and cry and look cute. Well, I also remember the day that mom and dad split up. I was nine and they told me I could either stay in our house with dad or move with you and mom and our new boyfriend to Iowa. So I chose to stay. I mean, I didn't want dad to be all alone. I asked about you every day. Can I call Ellen? Can we visit Ellen? Anyway, I, I could tell it bugged dad asking about you all the time. I think he thought I was secretly asking about mom or something. So eventually I just stopped. Maybe I should have kept asking. I'm sorry I missed out on being your big brother. I also really wanted to be that for you. So the divorce as a reason for his behavior. Not only is it not the only reason, but it is also explored further than it is with Robin and How I Met Your Mother. And Ellen, who has also just gotten divorced, but is trying to find a way to get back into dating, being someone who, by virtue of being separated from her brother when she was very young and being married for so long, ended up having issues with talking to women. And so a big part of her character is her trying to regain her confidence, paired with her trying to reconnect with her brother who's also trying to help her with her confidence, but failing at it. I'd say she's the one that has the least character out of the main cast, but I think she's still pretty decent, especially as a jumping off point for having Jessie's arc of becoming less cynical, especially when she's already so upbeat and happy despite her situation. Then we come to Valentina and Charlie. Valentina is the Barney of this show, kinda, but as I mentioned earlier, she doesn't feel like an actual pervert just someone who enjoys being single. However, the funny thing is that she starts the show by getting into a relationship with someone just as crazy and impulsive as her. Valentina is extremely into Charlie because he rejected his wealth and fortune to live a full life without being held back by his massively rich family. But he's not used to living in New York, so he needs to get used to the fact he's not a fancy rich boy anymore. And that's what causes their first conflict in episode 1. It's how Charlie seems to not have given himself fully into trying to find who he is and wanting to go back to the comfort of his previous life, which he grows out of when they go to the Brooklyn Bridge and he realizes the beauty of both New York and Valentina, how, as opposed to his family, the city and his girlfriend are full of personality and radiating with life, which is why he decides to stay and actually give this a shot which is brought back in episode 6 when it's revealed he's moved to other countries for women before Valentina. But Valentina is the only time where he's actually decided he wanted to just stay. I have known for a very long time that I've had to escape from my petty, stifling family. And yes, I have often followed women across the world as a way of doing that. But it's never felt right. Until now. Both of them have their fears of actually going through with things, of taking that leap of faith. Valentina fears that she will lose her youth and her excitement if she settles down. Getting old and boring has always scared the shit out of me. I mean, Sophie's book nook literally sent shivers down my spine, and I've always put monogamy in that category. But with us, it's, it's actually kind of exciting. And she's never felt about anyone the way she feels about Charlie which terrifies her and makes her want to jump ship. And Charlie has always been scared of leaving his family even though he's always wanted to, as a means to find himself. But Valentina makes him brave enough to actually finally do it. And so, both people who are just extremely eccentric and who can't find who they are on their own, end up meeting and falling in love by making each other feel and realize things about themselves they never would have known without the other. And so, not only do I find that the characters in the show have some really interesting concepts going for them, I also think that they have enough development and attention where they have depth and nuance without feeling like caricatures or having their motivations feel flat, as evidenced by what I've showed of explorations of these characters and their background, and how they've been affected mentally, creating some pretty great characters so far who feel very real. With that, to finish the video, I'd like to talk about the aspect of the show that surprised me the most, which is the relatability. I know that may sound strange, but hear me out. How I Met Your Mother, by virtue of how it was structured, going through the years of 2005 and to 2013, had to follow the evolving world of the 21st century, with evolving technologies and ways of dating, such as in Season 1, having Ted try a matchmaking service, or in Season 7, showing how dating became making internet research on the person you're going out with before the date, which ruined the mystery and excitement of going on dates, or him trying online dating in Season 7 with Barney's help. However, these concepts are never explored further than one episode, or never actually are developed to a point where it feels like the show is trying to show 
how life was in that period. More like it just shows a fictional world that sometimes relates somewhat to ours, or sometimes tries to relate but really misses the mark. Kids, that day I had a horrible realization. If you can't spot the crazy person on the bus, it's you. However, how much your father seems to really nail this part. Firstly, he starts the show with Sophie taking an Uber, being driven by Jesse, which is how she meets Jesse and Sid which already fits really well to have Jesse working as an Uber driver to make extra money. Then we have the fact she's been using Tinder and the guy she's gonna go meet is someone she met on Tinder and who she believes is perfect. But Jesse seems to think he's probably lying to her if he's as perfect as she says, which again is very accurate to how people see online dating, while also helping characterize both Sophie and Jesse as having opposing views on romance. That might be just some superficial stuff, but it definitely helps to build the feeling of this show being set in our universe of making these characters be people who actually might live in New York. However, episode 2 is the episode that actually impressed me by how it did this. The episode is called FOMO, which stands for Fear of Missing Out. The episode has Valentina take Sophie to this club called FOMO to help her get over her failed relationship with the Tinder guy from episode 1, Ian. The club supposedly has a room for everything you can think of, as a way to make people never have FOMO and FOMO. However, Sophie still can't get Ian out of her head, as she keeps wanting to message him, when she sees something that reminds her of an inside joke she has with Ian. She can't focus on just having fun with her friends. She's scared of missing out on this relationship with Ian, even though she knows it can't work out. However, as she talks to Valentina, and then they go to Sid's bar and Sophie talks to Jesse, it's made clear that every one of them is suffering from FOMO in their own ways. Valentina fears missing out on her own independence, seeing as Charlie has been smothering her by having her help him get used to living in New York, with them living together, which makes her relationship move way faster than she was expecting. Ellen fears she'll miss out on being in a relationship and feeling loved like she used to, because she just got divorced and can't talk to women. Jesse fears missing out on his own life, the life he could have had with his girlfriend had she accepted his proposal, and Sophie fears missing out on being with Ian, a relationship she knows would be perfect for her, but that she also knows can't work out. And with that, they decide to just hang out at Sid's bar and enjoy each other's company, as the narrator Sophie says. It was hard to live in the moment in 2022. There was always some place else you could be, someone else you could be with. But every once in a while, you found yourself in the exact right spot. And you had that rarest of moments where you had absolutely no FOMO. And you could just be. This is the most relatable and perfect explanation I've ever seen of what having FOMO is in today's world, and I saw that so much in myself, and it just landed with me as showing how the show clearly understands how the period it's set in, even if it's the present, can still be an important aspect in how the characters behave and how the story has to be told around that. Episode 2 was the one that got me because of that, that incredibly real and personal exploration of fear of missing out, and how that's just how people are in 2022, and how sometimes you can find rare moments of escapism and not have to deal with that fear. So, to conclude, I've actually been thoroughly enjoying How I Met Your Father for the six episodes I've seen at the time of making this video. It's kept me very entertained, but it's also done something that impressed me more than just it being fun. It has made me get invested in these characters with six simple 20 minute episodes, and made me get a full grasp of each of them with all their nuances. Much like Community, though this show is nowhere near as good as Community, I can see myself rewatching it over and over regardless of how much the comedy lands on rewatch, because the characters are just so strong that I'm invested in their journeys, given the show continues being this good and doesn't overstay its welcome like How I Met Your Mother did. Overall, I definitely recommend watching the show if you're interested in seeing a few characters living normal lives being explored in a meaningful way with some decent comedy to go along with it. And if you've watched How I Met Your Mother and wrote off this show right away by virtue of it being a cash grabby spin-off, I'd say you should give it a try and go with an open mind, it just might surprise you. Gonna get my girls, get your boys, gonna make some noise. Gonna get proud, eh? Gonna get, get a, a little, little unruly.